So uh, we are now looking at models of memory for this lesson and we're going to do one model today. We'll do a second model by the end of the week. Uh, but what you will need is however you're writing your notes, whether that be typed in, written down on paper, or written into the booklet, you'll need that. You'll need a separate piece of paper because there is um, two starter activities that I'll need you to write down. Um, and then if you're writing your notes on a piece of paper, you will need to have the booklet up on your phone or something like that just so you can read through um, the case study uh, for this. But models of memory, we will look at uh, in a second. We just need to do two little starter activities first. So first one, what are the approaches and can you list the assumptions for each one? Not much description or anything, just list them. Pause the video, see what you can remember. So it doesn't matter what order they're in. Hopefully, we should be fresh in our memory as we should still be revising. Here, here are your assumptions and your approaches. So you've got psychodynamic, behaviourist, cognitive, social learning theory, humanist and biological. If there are any that you missed out, can you put a star next to them, write them in, and then that's the thing that you need to start focusing on for your revision. It Just because we're not in college doesn't mean you just do the lessons. You're going to have to make sure you're stepping up the revision, especially for our return to college. And then start at number two, something you should be a little bit familiar with. What is a case study and are there any strengths or weaknesses of them? It, so just pause it, see if you can think of any case studies that we've already done and what are the strengths and weaknesses of those. So, case study is a research method that involves a detailed study of a single individual institution or event. It, usually it's an individual and you have seen two. It, you've seen Little Hans's case study and Little Albert as a case study as well. Um, so you have looked at those a little bit. We will do a lot more in memory. Strengths and weaknesses of them, they are very detailed. So they find out a lot of information about that single person or institutional event. Um, but it's extremely difficult to generalise because those experiences probably won't be replicated again in someone else's life. It, so they're difficult to generalise. They're specific to the person that they have been, have been looking at. And that's what you need to keep in mind for looking at people with memory problems and things like that. So let's get on to our models of memory. Now we've had our nice introduction. So models of memory just means theories. So if you remember the cognitive approach, um, they make inferences it, because we can't physically see a model inside someone's brain. Even if we do a brain scan, it's not physically visible, but you can see the component parts on which part of the brain is active in certain times. So there are different models of memory because it's a rep representation of how psychologists think memory works and some people will disagree with others. It, so the first one we're going to do is called the multi-store model of memory and it's by Atkinson and Schifrin. 1968, originally revised 1971. So there's quite a, a bit to it. Uh, what you need to remember is the studies from last week. So coding capacity and duration, this comes into the multi-store model of memory and you need to know them for this. Um, but it's just essentially how does our brain take in anything? How do we make a memory? What is our memories made up of? So short term and long term, you need to know the coding capacity and duration. Um, when you're writing the, your notes down on the multi-store model, just write them briefly and just put a little bit of a star, refer back. In an exam question, which we will do towards the end, you are going to have to include some studies. Um, so be wary of that, especially in like an essay. So what is the actual model doing? So this is the basic model. It, the input on the very first bit is stimuli from senses. It, so anything like light, noise, smell, anything that comes into your senses first enters the sensory register. It, so the sensory register is the first thing in your memory, according to the multi-store model. Now, information here is stored in an iconic memory, which is visual and echoic. So that's its coding, iconic and echoic. It's a visual and sound. Information here lasts for around half a second. It's extremely quick. Um, if you don't take it in fully, you won't remember it. It's forgotten. It, but it has an extremely high capacity. It takes every single thing in, but you only remember bits from your surrounding. Anything that you've not paid full attention to is forgotten straight away. It, so something like the registration on a car number plate as it drives past you, you you've seen it, your sensory register's taken it in, but you've not paid attention to it fully. So that's forgotten straight away. You don't remember it. 
Um, you might remember the little, first little bit if it's a bit of a funny word or something like that or a bit of a funny combination, but things like that, you are taking things in. Your sensory register takes things in all of the time, but the majority of it is forgotten. The arrow going across is attention. So that paying attention is the only thing that will let memories go into your short-term memory. And that is what is here. Short-term memory is the next store. To stay in your short-term memory, there has to be some kind of rehearsal. So maintenance rehearsal is the one loop going over the top of short-term memory. And anything that is not rehearsed at all is completely forgotten. So you might have paid attention to it, but if you've not rehearsed it, that'll be gone as well. Then you've got an arrow going across. So the arrow going across is the elaborative rehearsal. What elaborative rehearsal means is you've attached some kind of meaning to it. it so it means something to you, it, you've practised it a lot, um, you're doing it for a reason. You're not just doing it pointlessly. And that allows it to go over to long term memory. So that is how things that is inputted into your senses goes along to make your long to make it into your long term memory. It is stored memory forever, we presume. Now you know the studies on the code and capacity duration of long term memory and how we can't study duration and capacity of long term memory as well as we would like to, but we presume it's stored there forever. We can get it back into the short term to be able to speak about it a lot more. So that is retrieval from your long term memory to your short term memory. So that's the arrow going in the opposite direction on your diagram. Now, what we do know is that your memory is subject to some kind of decay. So even though it says that it's stored in the long term memory forever, it's, some things won't be as easily accessible. You might need a prod it, to be able to get them out. So, oh, that's familiar. I did that however many years ago. Um, but it might decay, it might fade, some bits of it might go. It, we just don't know exactly how, it, but we will look at different theories of why we forget things later on uh, in, in the next few weeks. But have a pause of this. Um, that is your basics, essentially. Uh, can you just write a note on that page? Like I said, you need to know the code and capacity and duration of each store. And I have got a little study for the sense to be registered for you on the next slide for you to make notes on. It's so a leave a little box on this page for that um, blank that you can just put in. Uh, but the short term memory and long term memory is the code and capacity and duration studies that we've already done last week. So that sensory register study then, hopefully the study we have got is by Sperling in 1960. It's a lab experiment and, ex and participants were shown a grid with three rows of four letters on. So just like the picture in the corner, they were shown this for 0 0.05 seconds and then they had to immediately recall either the entire grid or just one specific row. It, they knew which row to recall because it was a pitch of a noise. So if it was high pitched, it was a top row, middle, it was the middle row. And if it was a low pitched one, it was the bottom row. Um, and they were told this beforehand. So they just had to recall that row if a noise was sounded or the whole grid. They found that when they were asked to recall the whole grid, they managed to get about four to five letters on average. But when they were asked to do a specific row, they got an average of three. It didn't matter which row it was, it was always three. So even if it was the bottom row, they could remember WTY. But if they were asked to do the whole grid, they might have gone ALPKM. Yes, they can remember more by doing the full grid, but it's important that they could still remember any row. So they could still remember the bottom row, even that, though they've probably read that last. So they concluded that participants didn't know what was, row was going to come up. Um, so they were being able to recall three from any row shows that the sensory register does have a large capacity. Um, it's almost the whole grid, really, that participants can remember. But when they were asked to do the whole grid, because the duration is short without rehearsal, the memory had faded before they could finish saying the letters. Uh, so it's concluded that it's an extremely high capacity, but it's a very low duration. Uh, that's because of the being able to remember any row of the grid. Um, not just the top one. So that's your little study for the sensory register. For your short term memory, your long term memory, you've got your coding capacity duration. You do need to remember the coding capacity and duration of the sensory register um, with the iconic and echoic. It, but this study just backs it up saying that it's got a high capacity but low duration. So make sure you've got this down.
So you need to ha be able to see the booklet in some way, shape or form. We have a case study and it's the study of HM. And I think I've said this to you before or spoke a little bit about it. Um, if you also look on YouTube for videos about HM, there is a lot on there. Uh, so read through it and highlight it or make any brief notes on a separate piece of paper and then look back at the multi-store model and decide does HM provide support for the multi-store model or not? I want you to justify your reasoning. He supports it because or he goes against it because. So make sure you've got your reasoning. Don't just say, yeah, that's fine. It supports. That's fine. It's against. Might be a bit of both. It's up to you to decide. So hopefully you've read through HM and a very interesting case study really for you. Um, we'll use that in evaluation as well. Uh, but before we do the evaluation, we do need to make sure we can write about the multi-store model of memory. We can't just draw it. In your exam, you will get some credit, and I'm saying some for drawing it, but not a lot. Um, it would be much easier or much better in terms of marks for you to write about it. If you are seriously running out of time, um, as in you've got two minutes left, draw it. It'll get you something, but it'd be much better if you wrote, wrote about it. So, bit of exam practice. The, these questions are typed into your booklet. Um, give one strength and one weakness of case studies. Um, as a bit of a hint, you need two PCs and you can use HM in your example, um, in your E of your PCs, and then outline the multi store model of memory for six marks. Again, I'll give you a bit of a hint there. It's not enough just to say here's some stores, you need to include the coding capacity and duration. It, but that's 12 marks altogether. If you time yourself, pause the video, time yourself for 18 minutes, it, and then I want you to check back on your um, answers. It, so make sure that you've got as much as you can in there. So pause it now, time yourself the 18 minutes. So now we are on to evaluation. So PECs, I know it, that's your favourite thing. Um, basically, two supporting research for your strengths. It, so first one, supporting research through HM. In your E, show how or say how HM um, shows that STM and the LTM are separate and not unitary. Why is that a good thing? Provide support for the model. But I do want you to counter argue and say it's a case study on why that's a bit of a negative. Don't go into too much detail, but just a sentence or two. And then another bit of supporting research. You could use anyone really, but I've gone for use Peterson and Peterson study to explain how it supports rehearsal is necessary. Um, just shows that the arrows are important on there as well. It's not just the stores that are important. Yeah, so those are your two strength PECs. We should be pretty good at our PECs by now. So I've just given you a few hints on there. So pause it whilst you write those up. And then your weaknesses. So we have got a different, um, we use KF a lot. Uh, so try and remember KF, but it's case study still. So we've got contrasting evidence. So KF damaged his short term memory in a motorcycle accident, but he was able to process visual information, for example, if he read a list himself, but he couldn't remember it if it was auditory. So if someone else read the list to him. Um, so what does that suggest about the short term memory? Suggests that there are different types. Because he can remember things he read himself, but not that were read to him. But Atkinson and Schifrin just say the short term memory is one store and it only is in one form. So that's a negative because it's quite simplistic then. And then you've got artificial materials. Give an example of any research that is done around the multi-store model. Um, does it use items that you would usually use in everyday life, like names, faces or places? Um, so that what does that make it lack? It, you can link to the fact that they're usually lab studies well, as well with ecological validity um, or mundane realism, really. It's entirely up to you which you go for. It, but try and do counter arguments and things like that. Um, we need to develop our PECs a lot more. So that is the first lesson done on um, multi-store model um, or models of memory generally. It, multi store model is the simpler of the two, 
but it is still quite complex to get your head round it so you need to make sure you revise it you know it if you need to play the video again keep on doing it um, and just make sure you look over your notes a number of times uh, next lesson we will be doing long-term memory uh, so looking at different types of long-term memory in more detail and then by the end of the week we'll do the second model of memory um, but try and have a good look over these models of memory um, it's often asked about in the exams uh, they often like to link it to scenarios as well uh, so be wary of that uh, and just do a little bit of revision for me until next lesson uh, but hopefully all makes sense give me an email if you're not sure of anything you want me to re-go over anything for you or word it in a different way uh, but hopefully the videos are helping a little bit so see you next lesson